And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We appreciate your attention, and uh, also I look forward to seeing your questions. Joining me in the chat box, as you heard, is Dr. Anne-Marie Kimball, who, like myself, is a licensed psychologist. She has a Certificate of Proficiency in Clinical Geropsychology. Her PhD was in Counseling Psychology from Texas A&M, and she has spent time in the field. She did a clinical internship, postdoctoral training in the VA system, and so she has uh, clearly worked with patients that have uh, rehab needs. She was a staff psychologist for two different VA systems, and she did palliative care hospice rehab and worked in neuropsychology. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I started work in a children's psychiatric hospital. I went to work in a public school for a number of years. Uh, then I was appointed chief of child psychology on an inpatient psychiatric unit south of Boston. After that, I went to work at a rehab hospital. So like many of you on the call today, uh, I've had experience with patients with uh, rehab, and uh, from there I went into teaching in a university, and after that I came to Pearson to join their clinical assessment team. So welcome everybody, and this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about cognitive rehabilitation for TBI and stroke victims. We talk about using technology under the guidance of a trained clinician to support the improvement of cognitive deficits. So we're going to look at all the different areas where you can improve the patient's performance. You need to consider this a tool that provides deficit-specific therapies, and it does focus on the rehabilitation of patients with cognitive impairment. So we will focus on a computerized cognitive training program uh, that uh, was developed initially at Magdeburg University 25 years ago in Germany called REACOM. We'll look at the evidence for its use and how it will be valuable to you uh, as you uh, deal with patients that have either a CBA or a TBI. Uh, first, we'll begin by reviewing TBI and CBA, and I just want to quickly review uh, some of the material that was covered in the webinar last time by Dr. Kimball. So, my first question uh, to all of you is, uh, did you attend the previous workshop? In which case, I will be brief. If you could answer yes or no, I can see how much time I need to uh, devote to that topic. I don't want to repeat it for a lot of you if you uh, heard it already. So, if you could take a minute to just say yes or no. Were you able to join that webinar previously? So this is what we covered in part one. What is cognition? What is a cognitive deficit? What can be done to improve the functioning of individuals who have that cognitive deficit? what components should be treated, how is cognitive rehabilitation defined, and what are some of the characteristics of cognitive rehab. Is that the same thing as cognitive training or brain games? And is there any way modern technology can be incorporated into this new technique? So let me just go back to the poll, see if we have any more answers. And I'm not seeing many, Sherry. So with that information, I'm going to assume that we have a lot of people who weren't able to listen to the previous uh, part one version. And instead Peter, I'm not sure why the poll is not working, but in the chat box people have been answering, uh, and it's probably about half and half, yes and no. Okay. So we won't cover it in detail. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Mm -hmm. So this is what we covered. What is cognition? It's all these actions and processes that help us to acquire knowledge and understanding. So cognitive processes use existing knowledge and generate new knowledge. Some of the patients you have, when they experience a cognitive deficit, are going to ask questions. How is this going to impact me? What does this mean? What is the nature of this disorder I have? Is this serious? Is it pervasive? Will these problems persist? 
am I going to require treatment? Is this just temporary, or is it going to go on for some time? So those are some of the questions patients will ask you. And these are some of the deficits that we'll see resulting from brain trauma. And we see the adverse impact on attention, memory, executive skills, visual, spatial, and visual field. All of this was described for you last time. CBI and TBI are two of the most disabling conditions. So let's just quickly define it. I'll review the symptoms, and you can begin to understand uh, the consequences of this CBA, just as you would describe it to your patients. So a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident is something that occurs in the head. So it's important to recognize that you will see either uh, blood vessels carrying uh, oxygen and blood to the brain uh, will be deprived of oxygen. And if it's brief, it's called hypoxia, but if it's for a longer period of time, we will call that anoxia, and that can be quite serious because stroke is a disease that affects the arteries leading to and within the brain, and it's one of the leading causes of death, as we see uh, from the uh, graph here. However, as Anne-Marie pointed out last time, a significant number only have a mild impairment. So that stroke that occurs when uh, the blood supply is carrying oxygen and nutrients is either blocked by a clot or it bursts and ruptures. That means that the blood and oxygen is not going to the part of the brain that needs it. Also, it's not taking some of the uh, things away from the brain, such as carbon dioxide, uh, and so as a result, you may get a buildup of toxicity. What are the types of stroke? Stroke can be caused by the clot, obstructing the flow, which is called an ischemic stroke, or by a blood vessel rupturing, and it prevents blood flow going to the brain, in which case we call that hemorrhagic. Now, you may also get a transient ischemic attack or mini stroke, and that's just a temporary clot, but these can still be serious. Now, my son said to me, well, Dad, you've just described some things, just like saying a car has four wheels, but what causes a person to have that stroke? And the simple answer is, it could be from atherosclerosis. What is that? It's the narrowing and hardening of the arteries. What else could occur? Well, patients that have high blood pressure or who uh, smoke a great deal and have a buildup of nicotine, uh, patients who are uh, diabetic, or who may have obesity and excess weight, can also be at increased risk for a stroke. Now, beyond those factors, it's important to realize that some medications can also cause a person to be at an increased risk. So, for example, if a patient's taking blood thinners, and for some reason they need to stop taking it, it may have that adverse impact. And as Anne-Marie pointed out last time, one of the biggest issues, of course, is age. As we get older, we have increased risk. The older we get, the greater the chances are that we are at risk for stroke. So what are some of the symptoms? Weakness and numbness, loss of vision, problems with uh, sensation, understanding speech, particularly loss of vision in one eye, uh, balance problems, hiccups, severe headaches, loss of consciousness, dizziness. These are, can all be associated. So those are the physical symptoms. What does that mean to us as neuropsychologists? What are the effects going to be? One of them might be problems with vision. We may see patients that have an inability to so see the whole picture. They may experience visual neglect or so-called hemianopsia. We may have other patients that have an aphasia. They may have problems formulating a comprehending language. Some of the patients we see will have a loss of balance. They will feel a loss of coordination, loss of sensation. So we may ask them to show us how they do certain things, like how would you open the door, or show me how you make a fist, and that may be very hard for them. And then they just automatically go and do it when their timing is appropriate. What we also reviewed with Anne-Marie is that sometimes damage is very circumscribed. So if that is the case, for example, there's damage only to the fusiform gyrus, you may find a very narrow effect, and that is the patient may not be able to recognize very familiar faces. And I know you're familiar with books that have described patients that have that disorder. 
Now, a different type of injury is traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury. And as Anne-Marie described for you last time, some of the problems are caused by rotational force and some of them are caused by acceleration and deceleration factors. So if you were in a car accident and you were to hit the windshield or some other object, you may experience bruising caused by coup and contra-coup. That is the movement of the uh, brain within a skull causing it to be damaged on both the uh, side where they initially uh, force the injury and then on the opposite side. This results sometimes in uh, bruising and bleeding on the inside, and so you will hear about uh, subarachnoid hemorrhaging. We also see um, evidence of um, different types of axonal shearing, so the uh, connections between brain matter become uh, stretched and torn, and that diffuse axonal injury uh, sometimes is a sign of just how severe some of that uh, traumatic brain injury can be. So, one of the famous ones, of course, was Phineas Gage, and that tamping iron and the pictures of his skull can still be seen at the Harvard Medical School in Cambridge. So here's one of the first individuals back in 1848 who experienced a very severe head injury, and he was described by his physician in those following terms. These are the personality changes that he went through. Surprisingly, he lived but what was most striking was the, the damage to the frontal lobes of the brain and the effect that had on his behavior and personality afterwards. Just a good reminder to all of us that when we're working with patients that have had an acquired brain injury, sometimes there are personality problems that uh, follow that. So the person may be quickly frustrated, uh, they may become labile, uh, they may misperceive social situations. And so here are some of the patient symptoms that they will report to us that they may feel sluggish, they may find that they can't remember things, Sometimes it's hard for them to remember the correct word. They may have trouble with word retrieval or comprehension of what we're saying. They may have trouble comprehending syntax. They may also lack insight, and they may be very easily distracted. So some of those symptoms are what we see accruing from injury. These are some of the physical symptoms that Anne-Marie reviewed with you, paralysis, uh, you may see hemiparesis, you may see impaired problems with motor skills, ataxia. Uh, you may also see double vision or uh, some type of hemianopsia as a result. Problems moving uh, the tongue and producing speech sounds. On a different point of view, what are the co cognitive characteristics that these patients sometimes will uh, reveal to us? Primary amongst those are areas of attention and concentration. And as you'll see later, that's a very good place to start with individuals that have had an acquired brain injury. We'll often hear problems with memory or the recall of new information, particularly work in memory. Uh, they may be slowed in their processing. They may uh, react impulsively without thinking ahead to what are the consequences. We may see problems with flexibility, judgment, and the ability to discern nonverbal cues, particularly in social situations. So it just goes to show that the cognitive characteristics don't stand alone, but rather they do need to be uh, seen uh, in uh, relation to other problems that the person may be having, other problems they may have. So these are some of the behaviors that we'll see, disinhibition, Social skills deficit, impulsivity, denial of disorder is a very common one. Uh, Babinski used to refer to this as anosognosia, but what we realize now is the patient just may not be aware of the nature of their problems, or when it's pointed out to them, they may have an anodysphoria, which means that they may make light of it. Now, one of the questions that these patients are going to turn to you and ask is, is there any hope for improvement? What can the patient themselves and their family and um, caregivers expect? And the answer is, we can now say that there is a program of cognitive rehabilitation uh, whose job it is to help m optimize the patient's functioning following this type of injury. So you may see that there is a restitution, there's a reestablishment and strengthening of damaged pathways. And recently when I went to AACRM, 
uh, Corbetta was talking about this being the main pathway for a lot of individuals that have had uh, some kind of head injury. We need to get some of those brain structures uh, up and running again. Or in some cases where there's damage, for example, there may be a stroke to, let's say, the left medial temporal lobe, you may need to have other pathways, other parts of the brain take over some of that functioning so the person can continue to communicate. And lastly, when we realize there are problems such as you'll find in memory, we may need to have patients learn how to compensate for some of those weaknesses, relying on external aids, perhaps on an iPhone app, uh, to remind them about when to take medicine or what they need to get from the store. So as part of this, what we're saying is it's very important for patients to have an awareness of what the problem is and how the injury may have affected them and to uh, become engaged in goal setting so that they can now begin to say, these are areas I need to work on to improve my functioning. And as clinicians in the field, we can rely on computer-assisted rehabilitation to support this goal. But it's important to make a distinction. I had a person once saying to me, oh, it's just like a brain game. Why don't we just do that instead? Well, there are some differences. One of the intervention characteristics is this, that the a task is going to be structured, it's going to be systematic, it's going to be customized for the individual patient, so they're working on things that are meaningful to them, it will involve practice and repetition and persistence, and it will be monitored. So one of the key features that Anne-Marie referred, uh, referred to last time is this entire process requires supervision and monitoring, and it's not just something that you can do uh, in a whimsical fashion. So can you use computers to assist rehab? The answer is yes. So is that the same as brain training? Absolutely not. It is not the same because of all those characteristics that are mandatory for it to be effective. And as such individuals as Ben Yeshe and Prigatano point out, it should be done as part of a therapeutic milieu where we're focusing on the needs of the patient. So what kind of computer cognitive training is available to us? And here's one example, the REACOM program, now available from Pearson. So I'm going to quickly review with you what some of those client and patient populations are, the role of the clinician, because sometimes uh, therapists have said to me, oh, that's going to do me out of a job. No, it isn't. If anything, it's going to assist you in your efforts to work with patients that require rehabilitation. We'll look at some of the distinctive features. We'll also look at the screening modules that are available to you so you can identify areas of weakness and then the training modules that are linked to those. I know for many of you it's going to be important to look at research, uh, what has been done over the past few years with this program, and do we have any evidence that it works. So let's review that. When we think about computerized cognitive training, one of the areas that the REACOM program focuses on is visual field. So uh, you're going to see some of the modules will screen for that, and some will also uh, provide therapy. Uh, one of the key ones that we'll start looking at is the area of attention. We'll also look at memory and executive function. So what you can see is that there are over 20 training modules that are configurable. It's also important to recognize that the program will auto-adapt to the needs, to the level and performance of the patient. One of the issues that comes up sometimes is, uh, will this go low enough for those that have had severe deficits? And the answer is yes. However, don't be misled into thinking it's only going to be easy. For many patients, actually, it's quite challenging. So what are the client-patient populations? Who can it be used with? Well, we may see patients that have a cognitive deficit that results from a degenerative neurological disorder. So it has been used with patients that have multiple sclerosis, for example. Our focus today is on traumatic brain injury and stroke, and certainly individuals that have had this type of brain insult or this type of uh, infarct uh, in their brain may benefit from the program. 
but there are other clinical conditions as well that will be uh, benefited from this. The range is from mild to severe, and in some cases, uh, our focus will be on restoring function uh, to some kind of pre-morbid level uh, to help optimize that patient. In other cases, we're going to compensate where parts of the brain may have been damaged and help the patient better come to terms with the problem they're experiencing so that they can move on. Uh, clients will work in a clinic or a hospital setting, and often this will be a rehab center. Now, who's going to provide this program? And the answer is, it can only be accessed through a clinician. It is clinician-mediated. So, although some of you may be thinking, well, it's going to replace me, the answer is no, that is not the case. Why does this matter? Because what we do know is that if a patient's left to themselves and they have a problem that may be diagnosable, they tend not to finish programs. So um, we've had a number of people say, oh, I've been working on something, let's say work in memory, and I did some program that's commercially available. And if you ask, well, how, how much did you do? How far did you go? The answer might be, well, I actually didn't finish it. Because often with self-administered programs, as they get challenging and they require persistence, that doesn't happen. Another feature is that the relationship between a clinician and the patient is very important. Now, I pointed out early on that it's important for those working in rehabilitation to really have an approach towards a patient where we can help them better understand what their problems are, help them become aware of areas of difficulty, the nature and extent of the problems they have, how it's adversely impacting them, and what they need to do to be able to overcome that. So we need to engage them in goal setting. We need to engage them in formulating a plan, taking into account how they were early on and how they are now so that we can help them optimize their functioning and achieve goals which are uh, measurable and achievable. Um, there's, there's a acronym called SMART. So some of you will be very familiar with SMART or SMARTER. Uh, where these goals are actually realistic and achievable and need to be uh, something that is simple enough for the patient to be working on and that they buy into. It's important for us to work with the patient so that we can say, this is why you're doing it, this is how it's going to help you, this is going to help you achieve some of those goals that you have set for yourself. And that relationship that you as a clinician have is very important to engage them and to facilitate persistence. So, what we know is that even if you were to do some kind of computerized cognitive training, when you have a more severe disorder, it would be very rare for that to be a standalone treatment. Clinical expertise, your experience, your knowledge and understanding, your oversight is integral to be able to manage the process. In some cases, you're going to see that the patient's able to easily perform tasks at a simpler level you can make it harder. Or in some cases, they don't need to have the instructions repeated. Or in other cases, they may not need to have the stimuli exposed as long. And that can all be changed. So you are integral to the uh, patient's success. It also helps uh, by automating some elements of treatment and creating greater efficiency and efficacy. So if you know you've been spending a lot of time trying to create a task that will meet the patient's need, and also you need to document the goals you're working on and document the progress the patient's been having, if you can automate some of that process, it actually might make the task a little bit easier for your job too. So by having tasks available that the patient can work on and uh, having tasks that can then be automated, it means that you can actually have more than one patient doing this at one time. And what we know in a lot of rehab centers is that you as therapists may need to be engaged with more than one patient in order to maximize your efficiency. Accessibility. This means that you have more opportunity to oversee the overall treatment management and not just take care of small details. So as care becomes complicated and as you work with your colleagues, 
in trying to achieve goals in that therapeutic milieu, it's going to be very important to take a step back sometimes and say, what is it we're trying to achieve here? Is this enabling the patient to get where they need to be? And do we need to adjust some of those goals? Or do we need to review and, and uh, perhaps um, add more uh, detail to that? Now, what clinicians would be involved in this entire process? As you can see, uh, clearly, we, we recognize the, the value of physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, and perhaps even physicians that are uh, experienced with psychiatric problems. And so in cases like traumatic brain injury and CVI, uh, you might need to have somebody working on the behavior and the physical aspects, but you would also need to have somebody whose focus will be on how can I help optimize this person's, let's say, fine motor coordination or their muscle or their, their balance and their coordination, as well as can we help them uh, with any word-finding problems they may have or language formulation or language comprehension problems they may experience. So speech therapy uh, is one more group that we know is going to be actively involved. I know, for example, when I presented on a traumatic brain injury to a group of speech therapists just outside of Washington, D.C. about a year ago, many, many people in the audience were um, qualified clinicians with a speech therapy background working in rehab settings. So uh, they needed to be uh, recognized for their contribution to the overall treatment plan of these patients. However, uh, other professionals may also play a role. So you may get a physiatrist. Uh, you may get other types of physicians or clinical staff. Uh, many of you on today's call are psychologists or neuropsychologists, and you appreciate and understand the role that you play and how you can collaborate with uh, some of these other treating uh, therapists and uh, clinicians. So we are suggesting that a comprehensive approach uh, involving a variety of clinicians uh, may be the way to go. Uh, it's very rare that you'd have only one clinician working with a patient that has this type of disorder. And those multiple perspectives will allow you to have, let's say, a trans professional a type of point of view on what is it they're working on and what part is that going to achieve in the patient's overall care. Now, Development and distinctive features. First of all, it's important uh, that the program be relevant. As we indicated, uh, the program uh, COGMED, I'm sorry, the program REACOM was developed by uh, clinicians, in particular uh, university neuropsychologists at Magdeburg University, so the clinicians could use this in a rehabilitation setting. So from the outset, the program was intended to be relevant. And feedback from clinicians over the use of this program and over some of the challenges, obstacles, problems they were facing allowed uh, the clinicians who were developing the program to work on it, to improve it, to expand it, uh, so uh, that uh, it can be uh, improved uh, from the uh, very early modest beginnings. It offers a distinctive and broad range of training. Uh, I mentioned the COGMED program, which enhances work in memory, but as you can see, this is broader. It includes other types of memory, as well as some executive skills and visual scanning. Breadth. Uh, unlike some programs, uh, this is something that can be done on an inpatient basis with patients who are severely impaired and it will uh, allow them to uh, progress as well as uh, individuals who are, uh, let's say, mildly impaired whose difficulty level um, may not be as low and uh, as a result they are looking for more challenge. Uh, I was talking to a rehab team at a um, hospital which had a very large uh, teaching university affiliated with it, and they were saying, we get a lot of faculty. We also get doctors and, and lawyers and others uh, who come in um, with uh, some problem of a neurological nature, but their premorbid functioning would have been above average to superior. So we need to have something that is going to challenge them and allow them to go back to some type of 
very advanced pre-morbid level, and there's a breadth to this program. The other thing to bear in mind is that it is configurable. So you can refine and revise treatment. You can prioritize. You can shift levels of challenge. And uh, that's important. Now, on the one hand, it can be done automatically uh, by the computer. And I am told by uh, some of our psychology colleagues in Germany that a lot of the OTs, PTs, using this program in those rehab settings allow the computer to automatically do that. Uh, but it's important to recognize as a uh, uh, clinician, you can go in and change some of those parameters um, and adjust them and make them configurable. So once again, uh, you can customize it for the particular patients that you're dealing with. Now, what are some of those features? The first thing to note is that it provides a screening. So you can get initial baseline measure, a reference point, uh, you can see what the screening modules are for that very soon, and that will allow you to then determine if there's a problem. Uh, as we indicated, uh, the program adjusts. Uh, there's an algorithm that is semi-autonomous, and uh, you can modulate that yourself, but you can also rely on the computer to do it. Lastly, uh, there are um, therapeutic modules, and then there are reports based upon both the screening and the reporting. And these include graphs and numerical data, which you can then export, print, and enter into some type of medical record as you need. So one of the things to bear in mind is that it really is individualized. Uh, you will start off with certain areas, and then you'll be able to see, uh, is this too easy for the patient? Do I need to make it harder? Or is this too hard for the patient? Should I make it easier? So there's flexibility in the administration of this tool. So it allows you to be effective and efficient in the way you, in which you conduct your work. If you have a severe deficit, uh, patients can uh, be given tasks that are challenging at their level. Uh, you can also uh, find some of the very top levels to be extremely challenging uh, if you try to do them yourself. One of the key features about this program is that we provide a keyboard. So for some patients that have uh, problems with uh, dyspraxia or dysarthria, so they, they're unable to move their hand in a coordinated way, this, this is going to make um, the performance much easier. So it adapts to uh, the needs of the patient, and you'll see uh, that there are very large OK buttons on the right and the left-hand side. So even with patients that have a broad range of physical problems, this is going to allow them to optimize their functioning rather than to rely on the keyboard that may be attached to a computer. So screening is a very good place to start, and uh, this can guide what you do. Uh, what you'll also see is that you can start with almost any module. So you can start with uh, training in the areas of attention and concentration, uh, which we recommend. And patients that have problems, let's say, with their work in memory or perhaps with their visual attention may find this is a good place to start. One thing to bear in mind is that when you talk to patients about attention, they will rarely say that's a weakness for them. So you may need to describe what are some of the tasks that are involved with divided attention or visual attention or remaining vigilant, sustaining attention, so they can understand what is that in layman's terms and why would I need to work on that. And so you will be able to screen to see if that's an area of weakness, and therefore is that a good place to start. There are 20 training modules, and the same principles and structure apply throughout. So it does make training faster and more intuitive to people as they do it. The screening modules, let's start with those. In the area of attention, you can see there is alertness, selective attention, divided attention, and spatial numbers. And so if you have patients that are referred to you following a CBA or a TBI, you may find that one of their areas of particular weakness is area of attention and concentration. And you may have to say to them, these are some tasks that are hard for you to do. For example, when you go to a grocery store, can you find the particular ingredients that you're looking for? If you're looking to cook something, uh, can you get the ingredients that require and have them in the order that you need, and can you attend to the amount or measurement that is required, and can you select the right ingredients? So can you keep your mind on what you're doing? And uh, are you easily distracted? 
for example, if you're cooking something, do you find the telephone rings and you want to go and answer it uh, and you're leaving a hot stove? So are you attending? Uh, divided attention. You might use uh, a, a, an analogy like this. You may say, you know, when you're driving along and you're paying attention to the speed limit and you're paying attention to the um, uh, visual stimuli around you, uh, do you also listen to a conversation that may be going on or perhaps a song on the radio? So is your mind focused on the task at hand or is your mind being uh, asked to pay attention to more than one type of stimuli? So these types of explanations help our patients understand. Attention is an area that often they need to improve. When we look at memory, uh, you'll see that we're screening for memory for words and for work in memory. Uh, can you hold things in mind while performing some task? And as we look at logical reasoning, uh, can the person perform tasks that require some executive functioning? Lastly, visual field and visual scanning are uh, places that you may explore with patients. Often you're going to find that they're unaware that this is a challenge. So these are the different screening modules. Can they react appropriately under time pressure, control their impulsivity? Uh, can they select the right uh, stimuli? Uh, can they learn verbal and visual spatial material? And uh, do they have the ability to see their visual field? Now, uh, I know this is very busy, um, but I will try to walk you through it. The long bar refers to how far below is this person's performance. So what you will see is that the data are converted into T-scores with a mean of 50 and standard deviation of 10, these are Z-scores. Uh, you may also see percentile ranks. Uh, so how far below is this person's performance? Where well, you start at 50 or average, you can see this bar here. Let me use this one. This one here is going to show you this is significantly below average. Uh, this one is also in the red zone and is way below average. So the longer the bar, the further the deviation from the norm. And this is going to tell you, here's the training module, and this is what is recommended for this patient based upon their performance. You may find in other cases, for example, here, uh, where they're doing spatial numbers, um, and are there any problems with perception of their visual field? Well, green is still in the average or normal range, and so it's not that bad. But what you can see is that you're going to get graphs, you're going to get numerical data with percentile ranks, and then you can use this to uh, see how does this patient do uh, compared to others. Now, in the area training modules, these are the areas that are part of the uh, REACOM program. Attention. There are train 10 training modules for attention. And what we do know is a significant number of patients have problems with attention and concentration after they've had a stroke or TBI. As I alluded to earlier, you will sometimes find the patients themselves don't say, I have trouble keeping a mind on what I'm doing, uh, but they may find that family members will tell them, I just said that to you, or uh, you're not working hard enough. And what you'll also find is that when the person's having trouble paying attention to instructions, directions, uh, maybe the location of something they need, they may present with confusion or even fatigue, or they may find they have to read something more than one time. And it's rare, and that's even the case with uh, mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's, that a patient will actually say to you, I have problems paying attention. So you may have to say to them, here's some illustrations, here are some examples of something that may be harder for you right now. For example, when somebody introduces their name to you, do you remember what they just said their name was or what they do? Uh, do you remember uh, where you saw that person? Can you remember their face if you were to see them again? So there are different aspects that you may want to point out to patients. One of the issues to be aware of is that just because a person has an attention problem, does that mean any attention program is going to be sufficient? And the answer is no. What you can see from this research by Sturm and others from 97, if the task requires two complex requirements with a patient that has impaired attention, that doesn't actually help them. If anything, it may aggravate and exacerbate their performance. 
That's the reason why it's important to recognize where are they now? What is their capacity at this time? And if you screen, you may find that um, the patient uh, may have very subtle attention problems and it will suggest what the starting point should be. We also know there are different kinds of attention and they're located in different parts of the brain. So for example, when you consider this is the uh, uh, cerebellum down here, and here's the cerebellum here. I'm gonna get rid of that, let's use this instead. Here's the cerebellum. What we can say is when a person alternates attention, it's gonna involve, involve some of the frontal lobes as well as some of the cerebellar area. On the other hand, can the patient select uh, what they're going to pay attention to? Um, this might involve uh, some of the frontal lobe as well as some of the parietal lobe. And as you can see, uh, we're now looking at the right hemisphere and up here is the left hemisphere. So uh, for selective attention, you're going to see an increased focus on the parietal modules here as well as the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, and not so much the uh, temporal area here. So depending upon the type of attention, you may see it localized in different parts of the brain. And that's one more reason why we need to pay attention to what's the nature of that attention problem. What kind are they presenting with and what do they need help with? So um, this will be one way to help you better understand that you might start with selective attention. There are 24 different levels. If it's too hard, you can go back to easier modules such as alertness, reaction behavior. Or if that's too easy, you can go down here to 3D operations or spatial or divided attention tasks. So you can see there's a lot of different uh, types of attention that um, can be uh, trained. Uh, if you were to look at one very simple task, uh, you'll see that uh, can you match uh, for this particular set of flowers on the right here? So when you click start here, this is going to be level six. Uh, can the person um, find the correct match? In that case, it's here. And was this too easy for the patient? Then it will suggest where you should go next to uh, something more challenging, such as spatial or divided attention. On the other hand, if it's too hard, you can go back to an easier one. So notice how this is level six. You could go back to level one. Uh, one time I was talking to some OTs and PTs, and they said, we find this is too hard for some of our patients. I said, well, where are you starting? And they said, level six. Are you going back to level one or to an earlier level? They weren't even aware that was the case, and you can adjust it. Uh, you can also escape uh, to go and do that for the patient. So on the left-hand side, you can see alertness. Here's a child crossing the road on a bicycle. So these are very lifelike pictures. Um, here's some reaction behavior tasks. Uh, can the person respond appropriately to a visual stimuli, so a triangle this way? With vigilance, uh, can they keep their mind on what they're doing and find those correct stimuli as they're required to? Down here, we have some spatial tasks and some three-dimensional spatial tasks. Over on the right are some of the harder ones. Now, I mentioned earlier that you want to uh, bring the issue of awareness to patients and also engage them on goal setting. And so here's one year where you can say, I know you'd really like to get back behind the wheel of a car. Uh, here's a divided attention task that's gonna ask you to monitor and modulate your um, speed. You're gonna have to pay attention to the police car that's in your rear view mirror, particularly if it's got flashing lights. Uh, there are speed signs along here, so you need to go slower and brake when it's appropriate. So can you react appropriately given the visual field task here? So as you can see, this is one of the more challenging ones, and yet it is one of the most popular in Germany. And of course, uh, they have autobahns uh, where a lot of patients may want to go back to driving again. Memory is also a very common deficit uh, for a lot of patients. There are different kinds of memory, as you may be familiar. On the left-hand side, we see declarative memory. So can a patient remember facts? Uh, can they remember episodes perhaps they were involved with, such as their wedding day? On the other hand, there are non-declarative or implicit memories. Uh, some of those are classically conditioned. Uh, you may find some refer to emotional reactions to certain stimuli. 
Uh, some may involve procedural memory, uh, so they've learned how to perform a task like playing a guitar, uh, skiing, riding a bicycle, maybe even driving a car. And we also know that uh, it depends on the age of an individual as to how certain skills may be acquired. So one of the things to be aware of is that children under the age of seven seem to rely on more procedural or implicit memory for new language acquisition, whereas adults may have to learn those rules and vocabulary. And I remember reading Howard Gardner's book on the Shattered Mind about a linguist who was very proficient in such languages as German and French. And so when he had a stroke, those were actually preserved, but his English, uh, his first language, was not. So very interesting to see how does the brain cope with language demands. Now, for memory, there are these different areas, work in memory, topological, physiognomic, or face memory, memory for words, figures, and verbal memory. So, work in memory, this is a little bit like a card game where you have to remember what was that card and where was it located. So it's selective and spatial, and it requires some mental manipulation. Uh, can you memorize the content and their positions? Can you remember figures? And can you remember words? So there are different degrees of complexity. And lastly, uh, we're going to uh, have stories read. And can the person remember those stories? With physiognomic, uh, that would be a face memory task. And this can even be personalized to, to family members or doctors and nursing staff that the patient may have to uh, deal with. Executive function is another area that REACOM does focus on. So these are skills that require planning, logical reasoning, and the ability to return to certain types of daily life. So it's uh, necessary for purposeful behavior. Uh, all those uh, ADLs and IADLs will be mediated through the executive functioning. And we do know it's a very common deficit in a lot of patients it clearly is going to affect uh, how the person progresses in their rehab. So it's very important to be able to produce a coherent, goal-directed result. So in the REACOM program, uh, the tasks involve logical reasoning, mm -hmm. planning a vacation, or shopping. All of those are areas that are ecologically valid for our patients. They may tell you this is something they want to go back to doing. It enhances their independence, their self-reliance. And so... Uh, planning a shopping trip, where am I going to go, what do I need, uh, where, what am I going to get in the store, as well as a vacation. Very important for a lot of uh, people to be able to plan ahead and uh, to anticipate potential challenges and problems. So uh, we don't have to motivate uh, folks uh, to do these. Uh, they do want to become more independent and self-reliant. And uh, if they can uh, perform some of these tasks, it actually will give them a better feeling about themselves. So you may see uh, lower levels of fatigue or perhaps lower levels of anxiety and depression, some individuals that do have a TBI. Lastly, we're going to be looking at the visual field. And as you can see, some tasks that patients have to deal with may involve depth perception, such as can you walk up this bridge? Can they appreciate mental rotations? Can they uh, reproduce some kind of visual construction or skill? So can they appreciate the complexity and copy that? And by the way, with the Ray Osterreith, uh, we do have to remember that and recall it and repeat it. Uh, or can a person uh, put together different objects in space or uh, use visual spatial skills for certain types of dressing, reading? grasp in an object, appreciating the location of arrows on a clock, and also being able to dress appropriately or navigate themselves in space. So can I find my way? Uh, I read one study done in Scandinavia where with diary entries, patients following a acquired brain injury and a program to enhance their functioning said, I feel better about finding my way home. Uh, and also knowing why I went out to get certain things from the store. And then lastly, we have certain challenges, such as can you set a table? Can you find the right pot for the right kinds of ingredients? And 
one of my favorite ones would be as the child grows, can they move in space without bumping into things and falling over? Or in the case of some of our older folks, are we finding that inability to deal with this kind of visual perceptual challenge is going to result in trips and falls and collisions? And sometimes the patients will present as quite bruised, and they may also say they hurt because they fell. Uh, this may actually precipitate admission to a hospital uh, in a number of cases where we do see some evidence of other cognitive decline. Can the person get help, um, or are we finding that they uh, are having a great deal of difficulty moving around? And then lastly, one of my favorite ones is this. That could have been me. I went to Ikea to get a bookshelf, and it said they have to be at a 90-degree angle. Boy, I had a hard time getting that all to fit, and actually went back to the store and talked to a girl about how to use the corner of a room to make sure I had the correct angle to force it. So with visual spatial processing tasks such as these, we may find it particularly challenging if you have a visual problem. And as we said earlier, there may be problems with such things as uh, appreciating the angles, uh, being able to uh, see a pattern, and also um, we may see that there's a problem with visual field perception. Now this doesn't happen a great deal, but you might find that sometimes individuals don't appreciate the entire visual field. So we do see following a stroke between 45 and 65 percent of patients will have a deficit in their visual field perception. It's less common uh, after a period of time. It's relatively uncommon in traumatic brain injury, but it is still a problem that faces uh, a lot of us because what we see is that the patient may even be unaware that there's a challenge. They will say the following, that they bump into things. They have trouble because of poor lighting. People have moved things on them. They didn't think they were there. Uh, they think it might be a visual problem. I need stronger glasses. And here's a very good illustration. So when you have a person that has a visual field deficit, on the right-hand side is what it looks like. They just don't see it. Um, and often a driver will say, I didn't see them. On the left-hand side, as you can see, here are two children chasing after a ball. And so I'm very familiar with one case where a, a woman had complained about her husband's driving, saying that he doesn't seem to see that well. And yet when the child chased after a ball, he braked very rapidly, whereas the examiner who was driving behind uh, almost rear-ended him because she wasn't paying attention, and yet she's the one judging his fitness to drive. So it's very interesting to me how sometimes people are unaware of a visual field. They may neglect. They just may not see it. And that uh, is something they may uh, also report to doctors that um, I, I don't think I've got a problem with my visual field. So we have visual field training programs. Uh, these involve saccadic training or restoration, uh, it also obviously is going to affect what you read. You know, does the person see their whole word or not? With saccadic eye movement training, which is frequently a result of a traumatic brain injury, uh, you may find that there's a real need to help the person uh, deal with different types of visual field that they are there for. So we've done the testing, we've done the screening, we've provided therapy. Uh, what kind of results do we get? So you can get very detailed information. Uh, you can progress through the different training levels, and you can see how does the person do over time. You can export the data, and it can also be configured. Operating rear comm. These are the things you need. You're going to need a quiet space with minimal distractions. If you're using multiple workstations, it may be also helpful to have headphones. We do encourage uh, the use of the Rearcom program in rehab settings where there are staff that can support the person doing the test, but there are also other people doing it so that they don't feel alone. Uh, and then the question might be, does it need to be networked to some other hospital uh, program or internet uh, for downloading and recording? So these are some of the features you'll need. I'm not going to go over that in detail. Um, I just want to quickly check to see if there are any actual questions that Anne-Marie would like me to answer before I go into the research. 
Uh, Marie, are you there? I am, and there are no waiting questions at this point. Excellent. Thank you very much for all the answers you've been providing. Uh, I recommend, if, if this is an area of real interest to you, to put your questions down so Anne-Marie can help you to answer those. Now, some of you are going to be uh, asking um, about research. So let me quickly show you this. Uh, we've reviewed the training programs. We've gone over the features. Uh, you saw that it's auto-adaptive, and you can use it to progress monitor and also report patient outcomes. You can use it in a variety of settings, but we do recommend uh, inpatient and outpatient rehab settings as being one of the primary places that this could really be helpful. It can be used with a number of different patients involving TBI and stroke and other clinical conditions. And as we said earlier, you can restore or help the patient learn to compensate. Uh, there are studies that have looked at its effectiveness. Now, what I'm going to do is quickly review some of the research. As we said, uh, Hans Regel uh, originated the REACOM program back in 1986, so it's been around for over 25 years. There have been numerous studies that have looked at the effectiveness of this program. In particular, we know that there are studies by Keith Cicerone and Rowling that have done meta-analyses of larger numbers of um, patient groups using computerized uh, programs to show their effectiveness. But here's a few for you to think about. Uh, in the U study in 2015, uh, he looked at the effect of computerized cognitive rehab on individuals that have had a stroke. In the Jiang study in 2016, they looked at it in combination with an acupuncture treatment program. And specifically, uh, Kim Merle Richter and others in 2014 showed how it could be helpful in stroke rehab, and in particular, how it may enhance work in memory and how it may add to uh, the benefits of semantic structure in programs for COG rehab. So what uh, she argued is that this experimental group improved significantly in work in memory and word fluency, and it generalized to prospective memory tasks. In another study, this time by Claudia Claudia Murden and others, published in 2011, uh, they looked at traditional OT versus OT plus uh, COGMED uh, for the treatment of visual field loss. So what she argued is that improved functional deficits compared to the standard OT showed the intervention uh, showed significant benefit. So uh, it was suggested that they start to look at lesion location in the analysis, but she found that it was better than just relying on standard OT alone. Uh, with TBI, uh, there have been studies by such individuals as Galbiati. Uh, as you heard, uh, Cicerone and Rowling and others have looked at the effectiveness of COG rehab programs for individuals that have had an acquired brain injury. And in particular, Fernandez published a study uh, done in Cuba, and that's here, uh, where she looked at memory improvement, particularly on the Wexler memory scale and parts of the trails test. And in her study, uh, which was not randomized, but it was uh, one looking at uh, the effects of uh, this program on such areas as mental fatigue, headache, and eye irritation, and she found that it was useful with 100% of the patients showing improvement in the trained functions. So there are a number of studies, and you can refer to the um, the page uh, devoted to research uh, on the uh, REACOM website to learn about more of these and some other studies that have reviewed uh, the evidence for the support. What we can conclude is that uh, there's certainly uh, research to show that it has efficacy, and not just with these two clinical groups, but with other groups as well. Uh, this is not really surprising since Cicerone has documented how this could be a useful adjunct and there are very specific um, modules in the therapy that could be helpful. And Anne-Marie uh, did refer to those in the earlier uh, webinar that was conducted. So, yes, there's data to show it works. And yes, uh, some of these studies do come from all over the world. Uh, are there any additional questions, Anne-Marie, that you'd like me to try to uh, respond to before we run out of time today? 
Um, Peter, there's not. Um, both Scott and myself have been answering a few questions here. There, there's one unanswered question that I'm trying to get clarification to. So if uh, the person who sent the question, how do you handle performance validity issues, would um, clarify your question a little bit for us, we will be able to respond in an email. Please. Very good, Anne-Marie. That's it. Thank Peter, you once Anne again, everybody, for attending. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Scott and Anne-Marie, for uh, diligently answering the questions that have come up here. We do hope that this program uh, is going to be of interest to you, and if you have questions about it, please do be in touch with us. Uh, Anne-Marie and I both work um, with Scott uh, at Pearson.com. Um, we would uh, like to hear more from you. Uh, if you have questions about can I use it in my facility, uh, could you uh, answer particular questions? Uh, please do be in touch so that we can um, help you uh, get those questions uh, answered. I, I see that uh, Anne-Marie has provided uh, our email addresses. And I will go back um, perhaps to the very first page uh, so you can see how to spell our name. There we are. So I'm Peter Entwistle at Pearson.com. And Dr. Kimball is Anne Marie Kimball at um, Pearson.com. And Scott Pawson is Scott.Pawson at Pearson.com. Um, 